Welcome to the podcast of MotorWeek, television's original automotive magazine. MotorWeek is made possible by TireRack.com and RockAuto.com. Here's your MotorWeek podcast host, John Davis. Thank you, Alec Webb, and welcome everybody to MotorWeek podcast number 258. You can tell by the cuckoo clock on the wall, it's time for this week's podcast, and I am joined by Over the Edge reporter Greg Carlos, who's also our podcast producer. Hello, hello. Our online content coordinator, Jessica Ray. Hey, everyone. And we're terrific to have him. He doesn't have, uh, have a chance to join us very often. Our Motor Week retro review guru, Ben Davis. Hey, guys. Good to see you. Who's there with you, Ben? I got, uh, this is Mazzy. Hey, Mazzy. He's a turkey. We named her after 90s uh, supergroup Mazzy Star. Uh, I knew it. I knew that's who you named him after. Brings a little intellectualism to these podcasts. It's welcome. Glad, glad to join us. She's a lab dog. She won't come back up. All right. She's a good girl. Okay. We have so much to cover. Let's, I'll, I'll stop with the ridiculous antics and let's move right into the main event. And that is the first serious drive of the 2022 Ford Bronco. Easily the most requested vehicle. Is it right, Jessica, that we've had in a long time? It certainly gets the most hits and engagement, uh, for sure. So let's engage with Ben Davis, who has just come back from driving it. Ben, take it away. Absolutely. This is a special situation indeed, because I've learned that there's 150,000 people in line to buy this thing sight unseen. And they have a lot of questions that need answers because they're filling out right about now. They're filling out their uh, build sheets and um, there's certain areas where they're not sure what to check off, you know? So uh, first of all, the, the vehicle is awesome. Both engines work excellent with the trans with the 10 speed automatic. And there is a seven speed manual with a creeper gear. They poured a boatload of money into making sure this thing was super legit off-road. It's so got all kinds of party tricks. The, the main target for this is obviously the Jeep Wrangler, right? Oh, yeah. There's no doubt about it. Okay. But they're also saying Forerunner is competition as well. <laughs> I mean, I accidentally called it a Jeep once during the event. and <laughs> You weren't kicked <laughs> out? They were super angry. But they almost threw you out. <laughs> you could tell. Anyway. Um, what is, does when you look at it? I mean, we've all seen photos. Sure. And and it's pretty impressive. It's very squarish looking, which is in line with all the Ford truck styling. But if when you walk up to it for the first time, knowing what a Wrangler looks like, does it look as tough? Does it does it communicate its abilities as well? It certainly does. Um, it, the classic vintage retro throwback styling is awesome. There's Brown no headlights there. and everything. Yeah, especially from behind the wheel, the look out over that hood with those uh, kind of gun sight trail markers rising up that are double as tie downs. That view, I, I'd never get tired of that for sure. Um, dimension wise, it's very similar to a Wrangler. It, it, it may look a little narrower by just a touch, but the lengths are pretty true to both two-door and four-door Wranglers. Well, I got you off track. So what it's like actually to drive on and off-road? On-road, the first one I drove was the luxury trim model, the Outer Banks, which is targeted directly against Jeep Sahara. And um, <clears throat> my, actually, we bought a uh, Wrangler Sahara a month ago. So I had direct competition to go against this one with. Um, it rode a little bit, just a little bit rougher than the Sahara. Um, but I, I was in the 2710 speed, which overall was a great performer. I, I did a lot of casual around town driving and 10 speeds is a lot to shuffle through for sure. And there were times through uh, slower, tricky elevation changes where it did hunt a few times for gears. Um, that doesn't happen as much with an eight speed Wrangler, but the package is, is fantastic. Uh, I highly recommend the Sasquatch upgrade with the 35 inch tires and the Bilsteins. Or how do you say that? Bilstein? Bilstein? Bilstein. Bilstein. <laughs> you, if uh, absolute highway comfort is your goal, many people wouldn't believe this, but those 35s and Bilsteins were, are way smoother than the, the uh, stock suspension that comes even on the luxury trim outer banks. 
Really? It rides much like a Raptor, which, you know, is like a, a country Cadillac. That was a big question for a lot of these buyers that are just checking the sheet off and buying it unseen. You would never think that, but it is just for that reason alone, uh, not to mention that it comes with lockers oh. with the Sasquatch package and all that stuff. But even if you're never going to take it off road and just want a comfortable daily driver, the Sasquatch so, package so, not only looks awesome, but it's the way to go. So the two seven is the V6 option and they have a four cylinder turbo option too, right? Right. So, so can you, and, and you bought a, you bought a four cylinder Sahara, Sahara didn't you? Was it yes. yes. Yeah. So but, what, like, what, like, I'd have to imagine that two seven probably puts out more power than Jeep's three six. Oh, for sure. Awesome. Yeah. I'm glad you brought this up because even between the Ford's 2.3 liter and their two seven, if you're just driving like a normal person, you're not going to notice a difference at all. There's a, a ton more torque available with two seven, but if you're not using it, uh, they behave quite similarly in power delivery, just in a, a day to day basis. But if you're going to throw a couple jet skis back there, or something close to close to its 3,500 pound towing capacity, or if you're just a natural born hot rodder, I definitely go with the V6. But you're not going to be wanting for power at all with the 2.3 liter. Now the four cylinder, that's probably your direct comparison, having just bought the the two the four cylinder in your Jeep, right? Correct. Yeah. Um, although I would say that the four cylinder in my Jeep felt more more powerful, felt closer to the two seven than the four. Right. It was kind of like just a touch over the two three in, in the the way it delivered power. You recently drove uh, the two three Wrangler, right? With uh, yeah, well, it was oh. it was the four it was the four by E, so it's not exactly a a, yeah. uh, a apples to apples comparison. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, I would imagine a lot of people are going to uh, order the two point three liter just because it's uh, the two seven cost extra, Funny. and you won't be <laughs> disappointed for sure. Yeah, you can get carried away with these things. <laughs> it's got the two three turbo has got what it's 300 pound feet of torque yeah with if you run a premium fuel then it, it'll tune it to 300 horsepower and, unbelievable yeah it's 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 big it's big yeah. power so i want to jessica since you're a jeep owner what do you think of of the what you've seen so far from the bronco is there anything you want to know from ben well, I mean, I think looks wise, it's, it, it looks really great. I mean, it has that same sort of silhouette. What was kind of funny is uh, Ben sent me a photo that I posted on our social media channels and it was sort of a, a rear shot of the Bronco. And people were like, that looks very much like a Jeep. Like it, yeah. it does look a lot alike, but to be fair, like, it's a square body. There's only so much you can do when you're playing with the right. very similar um, like dimensions vehicles. Um, what do I want to know? Oh, I don't know. Um, I well, guess off-roading wise, that's what I want to know. Uh, how did it sort of handle off-road? Ben, who was that just Good in the question? Crowd? That's my boy, Logan. Shirtless Tarzan in there running around. <laughs> Um, I'm sorry, Jessica, I interrupted. The, it's got these, it's like a magic bag of tricks that this thing has. All the buttons to activate this thing, they call the hero buttons, are right up on top of the dash. And they're these big, chunky, tactile buttons that feel great to push. Um, all automatics come with this trail turn assist, which essentially, if you hit the button and you turn it hard lock, either left or right, it will lock up. <clears throat> your inboard rear wheel and pivot you around like a skid steer. Wow, like a yeah. rally car. It's, it's nuts. It'll only do it up to 12 miles an hour, so you can't get crazy out of control. It might be 12 or 20 or wow. something like that. That's cool. Yeah, and all automatics come with that. And then you can a la carte lockers, you, uh, where you can get a rear locker alone, or you can get front and rear lockers. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to know. Oops. And if you go 
for the um, if you go for the Badlands package, you can even get a, a, a sway bar disconnect. Uh, very competitive with uh, with uh, Rubicon. Well, look, so, I, I think we probably off, to to move on. We got other vehicles we want to cover, but let me ask you what the answer to the question that you started off with. If you were going in and buying one. How would you configure it? We know we want the Sasquatch package. But what what trim would you get, and what engine? I mean, build me build me one. Sure, I would go with the. Uh, hold on, the uh, black. <laughs> oh my gosh! <laughs> I would go with the black diamond package. Black diamond, and because it comes with a uh, marine grade vinyl seat, which is pretty uh, pretty awesome. And I would just probably uh, a la carte order a rear locker. And um, I would go with the smaller screen too. Uh, the 12 inch screen is huge. It looks cool, but it almost looks too big for me. The eight inch screen is just fine. And then I would just go from there. Uh, uh, the color choices I would probably get hung up on the most, uh, either the white or the red. There's a lot of muted tones. Um, that just don't scream to me, but the, some of the blues are nice. And just have fun with it. There's a lot of cool uh, aftermarket stuff already available. So save some money for that. Are there power seats? Yeah, there are power seats, but you have to have leather to get them, I'm pretty sure. And the leather looks a lot better in pictures than it does in person. We just had that four by E in, and that I think that MSRP is for like, 50 over fifty thousand yeah. dollars and it did not have power seats oh really oh yeah. well you can get a 10 way or an eight way but i would hate to see the price tag on one with it actually i the outer banks that i drove had leather and um it didn't have a price it didn't have a window sticker in it all day long until i got back to the hotel and it was 53 grand <laughs> <laughs> well you know these things are going to be expensive because we're yeah. planning to make a lot of money on bucket well, thanks, Ben. I think everybody's been waiting with bated breath to find out what you thought about it. And uh, all in all, it sounded like a good report and living up to its expectations. Oh, yeah. If you're buying one, you'll be happy. And now I mentioned that uh, Jessica is a Jeep owner, but she also basically just got back from driving one of the newest Jeeps, the Grand Cherokee L, the first of the Grand Cherokee models, the three rower. So, Jessica, is it whatever, you know, again, this has been a widely anticipated, long-awaited vehicle. What'd you think? I mean, you know, to sum it up, it, it really was impressive, impressive all around. Um, I want to preface with a couple things um, because there was a little bit of confusion in some of the comments with my first drive. Um, but the, so this is the three row model of the Grand Cherokee. It is launching first. We don't have the details for the two row quite yet, or um, there is going to be a four by E, but we should have those details within the next month or two. Um, I believe Jeep plans to reveal it at one of these maybe summer auto shows. Um, so we'll know more then. So, um, and also the, this competes with um, like the Traverse, the Palisade, the Telluride, this is, is not full size. So um, the, it is completely separate from the Wagoneers. There was a lot of confusion there. And, um, you know, when I was talking to some of the Jeep, the people at Jeep, they were like, yeah, we weren't really planning on revealing these two cars um, or these two different models around the same time. So I think naturally people sort of were like three row Grand Cherokee, but they said they're coming out with Wagoneers. Right. Well, they're in two different vehicle classes. So just try to keep them separate in your mind. So it's a, it's a little bit confusing, but anyway, so it's bigger. It has a three row. It either can be a six seater or a seven seater um, because you can get the captain's chairs in the second row. And the third row is only two seats. It's not like a, a bench. So they've sort of the way they described it to me was they didn't want the third row to be this jump seat. They wanted it to be a third row that people could actually use. Mm. And, and they even demonstrated that while we were there by showing one of their engineers who's like six, four literally got in the back seat. Um, and while I can't explain, you know, I can't, I can't have like the personal experience of like a tall person in that back seat. <laughs> 
I was talking. <laughs> we'll have to wait till we get it, and Greg will get back there. Right, but... that'll be the test. <laughs> yeah, that's all I'm good. That's actually all I do at Motor Week is just get in the back of cars. He's the third, the third row guy, third row tester. But um, so so some of the other people I was talking to, they say that when you sit upright, yes, like it is comfortable in the third row. But if you, there is a sloping roof line with this new modern exterior. So if you lean back a little bit too far, they said it, you might hit your head. A Let's talk bit. about it, that a bit. The, the the Grand Cherokee has such an iconic look and through multiple generations, it's evolved, but it, it hasn't really, there's never been a revolutionary change to it. I don't personally think. So how would you rate what is it actually, if somebody sees this on the street, what are they going to notice and will they think it's a Grand Cherokee? I think they'll definitely know it's a Grand Cherokee. Um, it's, it sort of goes back to the boxy roots. It's certainly more square than the previous generation was. Um, they actually have made it more aerodynamic as well because... Uh, it's tough because bricks are not usually aerodynamic. <laughs> yes, exactly. I can attest with my gas mileage. Um, but but so it's more aerodynamic. They're using more aluminum parts. So the vehicle overall is is lighter. Well, not lighter, but it doesn't weigh quite as much as you would think because it is 15 inches longer with this wheel, with this wheelbase. Um, the wheelbase itself is seven inches longer. It's only about 150 pounds heavier than the previous generation using all of these, you know, trying to use less like intense steel. So, um, but also it's on a brand new platform. So it's a unibody architecture with front and with independent front and rear uh, suspensions. And so they use this, um, the, uh, I believe it's the quadrilift air suspension. So the ride quality on the highway it is, is, is great. I mean, it's, I love any vehicle that really has an air suspension in it, but you can really tell. It's, it does feel heavy though, a press of the brake, a press of the brake and you can feel you got a lot of weight behind you, um, but it's still really nimble and the, um, with, with the air suspension. And of course you have your option of um, either a V6 engine or a, you still have the V8, which in that class is almost getting rare. Usually it's yeah. mostly just V6s. Um, but there's just a lot of like goodies. Really the biggest change is inside. You know, we saw the pictures of the Wagoneer and you can completely tell that, that this is the new design language for Jeep. And this is the way that they're gonna be moving in because it was incredibly, it, it just reminded me of what we've seen in the Wagoneers. Obviously a little bit less opulent, but still quality was much better. Um, it just, it just, it definitely felt like I was in, it did not feel like I was in a Jeep so much anymore. Um, Cause I know that we, I went back and I watched some of our old road tests on the previous generation Grand Cherokee. And like one of the last ones, I think even, you know, in, in your voiceover, John, you mentioned that like, it was very, you were just not impressed with the interior at all. It, it's never been a Jeep strong point, I don't think. But the they have a new Uconnect infotainment system where it, the, the it's like a 10 inch screen on the dash and it's the center stack is so simple. And, you know, a lot, I know a lot of people hate when they just plunk, uh, you know, a, a screen right, right in the middle, but this is just nicely laid. It's in the perfect spot. It's very quick. You can customize it. So if you were like, you know, you want your climate controls on the main page, you can have it right there. Um, there's tons of off-road controls. I feel like there's, there was so much, there's an available night vision. Um, there is- It really even, is. You can make it as luxurious as you want it to be. Yes, exactly. I mean, it starts around like, like I think it was 38,000. And then the, I was in the Summit Reserve, which is like top of the line, and the MSRP was uh, over sixty five thousand yeah. dollars. Wow! Yeah. But it's it's it feels way more luxurious than ever, and it just 
they have so many like little things as well. Um, they're coming out with some, uh, they're gonna have a, like a hands-free level two autonomous system that's gonna be coming out so that you can get that eventually with over the air updates. Um, the, it has a, a, a fam cam available. So if you're like, you wanna check on your kids that are sitting in the back seat, all you have to do is press one button and it's right there. <laughs> no so, turning around. Yeah, yeah, no need for uh, the little like mirror on the back of, uh, <laughs> you know, the car seat. You just have, there's cameras everywhere. So it's- I think the Pacifica hybrid we had in a few months ago had that and I was playing with it. And yeah, you bring up that screen and uh, you know, it's actually pretty intuitive because you just touch something and it's like, all right, I'll zoom in on that. I didn't expect it to be like, okay, I can just touch places and it will just zoom on to where, so it's actually pretty cool. I mean, it sounds kind of gimmicky, I think when you say fam cam, but I, now that I'm almost having a second kid here, I can definitely see where I would need that because I know my kids are just going to be rascals. So I'll need to keep <laughs> that way you can, then can zoom in on the culprit. Exactly. <laughs> it also oh, has one other feature I want to mention is that um, in the second row with the captain's chairs, you know, they wanted that third row to be usable. So it's very much like a van where you don't have to, it just slides forward. You have a car seat, it just slides forward. You, it doesn't have to fold Good. flat. Good. So like anybody could just hop in the back. They wanted it to be usable. Um, and of course, there's three off-road systems. Um, and it's just one of those things that, you know, people are going to be buying this Summit Reserve package, $65,000, top the line um, off-road package, and they're never going to use it. No. <laughs> but it's very capable. It, this, oh, man, I'll be honest <laughs> with you. I, uh, this sounds great. Like the vehicles are technologically awesome. But I'm getting very depressed just thinking about how expensive both the Bronco and this Grand Cherokee are going to be. It's like, I hear you. It's like, can I get car can loans get are going to be ten years before you know it? I'd love to buy one that you don't have to have all that stuff in because I'm not paying these engineers for that. I just want to coastally cruise around and look cool with the doors off. <laughs> uh, yeah, was it is it easier? Do you think? I'm sorry to go back to the Bronco, but I was curious um, if we could just go back quickly. Was it? Is it easier to take doors and you know parts of the car off of the Bronco than it is at Wrangler, or is it about the same? I did take the top off. Uh, it has a, a like so, sort of a freedom top, <clears throat> and uh, yeah, it's just as easy. Uh, the the levers are very similar. There was more effort needed to uh, uh, to undo and do the lever, the uh, the hinges in the Bronco, but very similar. And the cool thing about their four door is the, there is a big panel over the rear passengers that can remove as well on the hard tops and still leave the very back hard top area. And Jeep doesn't have that. Jeep only has a split on the hard top that comes off over the front passengers. I thought that was pretty cool. Of course, there's nowhere to put it unless you put it in your garage. So, I mean, you have to commit. <laughs> Before we leave the uh, Grand Cherokee L, you know, that's the thing that gets me is you pay all this money and who's gonna actually take it off road. But did you have a chance to see how capable it was, Jessica? Oh yeah, yep, yeah. They had a whole off-road park set up for us. Um, it, I would say it wasn't quite as fun as that Subaru Outback that I took, <laughs> but, but um, it certainly proved that uh, it was extremely capable. Um, and, you know, over some rock gardens, of course they had these set up with skid plates underneath. So you weren't worrying about worrying about nicking anything but um you know a hill descent assist the whole shebang we are, they had us at like a 45 degree angle on a great on like a rock wall which was um pretty impressive so yeah it's it's uh they had the camel the, are they called the camel humps or um they had they sort of tested it on that and so I was, they didn't have me drive, obviously they had a Jeep person drive, but I was sitting in the passenger seat. And so you're basically going like this to this, you know? Yeah. And the landing was so gentle. Really? So gentle. I could not believe it. 
And it was just really smart how, you know, I mean, they really designed them so that when the, the top of the line um, off-roading system, you know, that when it sort of senses slippage on one wheel, it shoots all the torque there and it'll get you over where you need to go. So it, it's, like it I said- makes, it, it makes an off-roader out of almost every novice and every owner. Basically, yeah. exactly, yeah. You know, we, we should mention for those that are not terribly familiar with the Grand Cherokee L, the L stands for length, that's the three row. There will be a two row model and it's not, it hasn't been shown yet. However, some photographs did, uh, spy shots have surfaced recently and it looks, they're commenting that maybe it's gonna be a little sportier looking than the L, who knows, it's all camouflage stuff. But if you're a two rower and you like your two row uh, Grand Cherokee, you're not gonna be left out. I wanna now go to our third vehicle we're gonna talk about today. And we're gonna to turn to Greg, who's gonna talk about the, um, the newest from Genesis. It's been long awaited, their GV80. What is it? What does it look like? And was it worth the wait, Greg? Yeah, before I get into it, I was gonna say like, this is kind of the least important of the three vehicles we're talking about, but not it really Genesis. isn't because it's, I mean, Genesis, it's a huge deal because it's their first ever SUV. And that was a massive gap in their lineup. And what was a pretty good lineup, what started with, the G80, which was originally the, you know, the, um, the Genesis, uh, the Hyundai Genesis, uh, the G70, G90, and now we have the GV80. Uh, this goes up against, you think, BMW X5, Mercedes-Benz, GLE, uh, Audi Q7, Volvo XC90. So some stiff competition when you're talking about these, especially the German SUVs, which have been around for a while now and have become extremely popular. Uh, but Genesis has put together a very, very nice SUV. Uh, and it's good because it took them a while to do it. So the fact that it is good, uh, you know, at least they were doing something that entire time <laughs> we were waiting for an SUV. Uh, I will say I was, I was doing some research just to kind of refresh myself because it has been a few weeks since we drove it. So I wanted to get, make sure I had horsepower numbers and all that right. This thing got ridiculous reviews from car and driver, just about everybody giving it like 10 out of 10s. And it's awesome, but I, I, maybe I just didn't get a great experience. I don't think it was that awesome. I mean, it's a great SUV, but I'm, it, if you talk to some other people who've driven it, it's like the best thing that's ever happened. I, I just don't feel that way. You know, it's, it's very attractive. It's got that bold, expensive looking Genesis face. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's the same chassis as the Hyundai Palisade, correct? I believe, yeah, I believe you are correct. But, but it's not the Hyundai Palisade. I mean, not at all. everything is different. Powertrain is different. Ride is different. Seating positions are different. I mean, they're both, the only thing in common really that you obvious is something underneath you can't it, see or the fact they've got three rows of seats. I was blown away how by how opulent it was, but you know, there, it wasn't perfect, right? I, I don't think so. I thought it, at first use, everything felt a little bit too like labor intensive. If you wanted to do anything, it was it almost seemed a little convoluted. Uh, I did get the swing of things a little bit later. Um, I, you know, I think going back to what you said about the, the Palisade, I think the jump between Telluride, and I know we're going to different brands here, Kia, Telluride to Palisade, there's a fairly decent jump in luxury, but the jump from Palisade to Genesis GV80 is a huge jump. I think it's much, much bigger. And I think in terms of luxury, interior wise, it definitely rivals BMW. I Mercedes, I would put it behind Mercedes because I think Mercedes does a really nice job with their interiors now. I think everything looks great, it works great. Audi, I still maybe put slightly ahead of Genesis, but that's because I've used so many Audis and I've gotten used to them. Um, but their, inside, price point, their price point's amazing. The price point for the least expensive GV80, which is enormously well-equipped, is less than the top Palisade. And, mm. and I thought, wow. I mean, I, I was shocked how inexpensive you could get into uh, the GV80 and it was extremely luxurious. I'm sorry, you're getting ready to talk about the interior. 
What's up, Benny D? Oh, is there a 10, 10 year, 100,000 mile warranty on that? That's a good question. It, I mean, considering it's a uh, Hyundai Kia pro or a Hyundai product, you sure, would it think is. it was. Yeah. That, yeah, that's huge in that price point. Yep. Because... I have it right here. So Genesis, uh, uh, five year, 60,000 limited and 10 year, 100,000 powertrain. Gotcha. You were getting ready to talk about the interior, Greg, and I stopped you. Go ahead. I was actually going to mention, you had mentioned pricing. So to give you specific pricing, it does start under 50 grand. And yeah. then if you go up to, and that's with the base um, two liter, I'm sorry, a four cylinder turbo engine. Uh, they do offer a twin turbo V6, which I felt like in doing the performance uh, acceleration testing, I feel like it needs that twin turbo. It's not like it's totally underpowered if you go four cylinder, but a big luxury SUV, I feel like needs just that, a bit of excessive power. And you'll get that with the twin turbo V6, that's 375 horsepower. But when you get there, that gets you uh, all wheel drive standard. And then when you're talking about that engine, which is quite a bit more money than the, uh, the four cylinder, it's like 10 grand. Uh, you're, you're looking at about 71 grand or so starting at that top tier. Uh, so it, it, it's not exactly cheap, but when, again, if you compare it to BMW, Mercedes, you can get a very nice one for uh, not so much money. And I think that's what Genesis really has going for it with this GV80 is bang for the buck, uh, like, like with all the cars in their lineup. Uh, but yeah, the interior is very comfortable. The dash is very plain looking, except for the, the big screen that comes up. It looks like it should slide up from the dash, but it does yeah. not. Uh, it's just there the whole time. And uh, you control that through a center controller. So you're not reaching up and, and touching it. Uh, but very clean looking interior, um, big wheels on the outside. I know we kind of glanced over the exterior styling. Uh, 22 inch wheels are just massive. And it looks like Bentley-esque, but not like a Bentley knockoff. You have that big triangular grill, the whole two light design that works from the front all the way back to the rear. Uh, very, very good looking, premium looking SUV. Anybody else got any other questions or comments about GV80? I mean, I, I think it looks great. I didn't get a chance to drive it, but what I am excited for is uh, the GV70, mm -hmm. which will be a smaller version, uh, another SUV to the lineup. And I've seen a lot of these GV80s already out on the road. So people are buying yeah. them. People want them. I think, it, I think they are a lot of bang for the buck. They handle the road well. Uh, from, it was comfortable. Uh, you, you could push it a little bit on twisty roads. But I felt in the slalom, which I realize not everybody does, it was very soft. Yeah, I mean, it was, it, was, it was a little soft. It was, it was almost like old Detroit soft. It, 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 it behaved well. But when you took a corner, you felt that weight transfer a lot more than you do in a Palisade. Which, which is fine if that's what you're going for. But if you want something that is like a performance SUV, which are becoming more popular, I would say you're probably looking BMW, Mercedes for if you, an Audi, if you're looking for like a real performance SUV. But I think we have to give them a lot of credit. It, it is a fabulous first effort. Maybe it isn't perfect. Maybe we're not giving it all tens, but it it's much better than I would have expected, you know, right out of the box to be. Price is a big deal. I was just complaining about it and the fact that they can undercut uh, the Germans yep. uh, and make a, a really good SUV still. It doesn't feel like it's cheap at all. I mean, that's that's huge. No. All right, that was, those were superb reports from everybody, uh, but now we're gonna move on to our lightning round. Um, we're not really gonna limit everybody to 30 seconds. Just tell me what you think. Okay, a new Toyota Tundra has been a long time coming, 12 years, I think. The first image of the redesigned full-size pickup was supposed to come out a bit later, but uh, some spy shots were circulating uh, and shots got out from a dealer meeting that Toyota had. They told the dealers not to take any pictures. And of course, somebody ignored it and put it on the, image, the internet. So with that image all over the internet, the brand decided to put a, an, official, an official picture. They tweeted it out, the Tundra and TRD Pro Trim. So rather plain looking. What do you all think? 
I'll reserve my comment about it till I till I hear everybody else's. Greg, you want to go first? Uh, yeah, because I I guess they don't trust journalists as much as they trust uh, um, dealers. Because when I was at that Toyota event, which I talked about on the previous podcast, I actually got a look at a fiberglass model of the Tundra. We weren't allowed to take pictures. They basically took us in this dark room, didn't tell us anything about it, and just said, hey, here's the Tundra. Look at it. Don't take pictures. Don't do anything. And let's get out of here. We spent like 10 minutes just looking at it. Uh, so... Uh, the leak was not me is what I want to say. Uh, uh, I, I do think I, I, I'm a little skeptical that it was like a true leak because this is how car manufacturers treat the internet now. It's like, there's no such thing as like a bad leak anymore. But like when you're talking about a, a truck like this, who everybody's been waiting for. So I think it ended up working out fine. All right. Describe it to us. Describe what you saw in that room and what people are on the oh, internet are, are looking oh, I saw the one that was leaked. So it was like that burnt orange color. Uh, it wasn't TRD Pro form. Um, the one that t uh, Toyota tweeted out was a white one, still TRD Pro. So you're looking at a massive grill and would you expect anything less on a full size truck anymore? I mean, it just takes up the entire front of the vehicle. Light bar under the Toyota badge, which is, it's not the, uh, you know, the, the oval Toyota badge, badge, it's Toyota written out, which is all the rage these days. Light bar under there, a little bit of uh, light action happening on the lower grill. It's very boxy and it's akin to what you'd see on a forerunner where there's just like lines go horizontal, then it's going vertical. So, you know, rugged is I think the word that everybody would go with in terms of that. Uh, but, you know, this again, this is a TRD Pro. So it's like their top uh, like trim level in terms of aggression. So I'm curious what a standard Tundra, like how much carryover will be there. Uh, but one thing's for sure, it's big. It's very, very big. In your and face. In your face. And I, if you have looked at any kind of Toyota recently, I don't think it's anything we didn't expect. I think it looks like what the next Tundra would look like if you had put any thought into it. So I don't think it's like, wow, I can't believe it looks like this. I just think, yeah, that makes sense. Looks looks pretty good, but I'm not a huge fan of Toyota styling to begin with. Anybody else? Yeah, I mean, I think it's just kind of, it's got this big bloated look. I think bloated was oh, the on, first word. On. Give me the word, give me the word. No, bloated, bloated, yeah, that was the word. That's, that's the, first thing, word. the first thing that came to my mind when I saw it. I was like, oh, that's big. You know, because <laughs> it is pitch huge. You have to think, you know, because everybody's like, well, what's the next gen um, forerunner going to look like? Sequoia, you know, everybody's keeping an eye on what are the next generation of Toyota trucks going to look like? I think we and know. I think we we now have a little bit of an idea. Um, <laughs> and I mentioned this, I think, in a previous podcast, but my mom owns uh, a Lexus a GX. And that is styling that is in dire need of an update. I mean, that also has that bloated look as well. It's just big, it's big, it's chunky. And I mean, people keep buying them. So clearly there's something there, but well, I mean, it's like, you know, I feel like people buy, bought a forerunner in, in 2010 and then they bought a 2021 to upgrade and they basically have a very similar forerunner <laughs> um but if, like i said if people want to buy them and that's the way that toyota wants to go then i guess that's where they're going to be going any any comment um at first glance i thought the trd pro looked kind of like a freshly reimagined first gen raptor which oh. i thought looked awesome um but yeah, it's crazy how those Lexus GXs and Forerunners, even from 2006, bring such huge money in the uh, the residual value is incredible. And I, I, I gotta tell you, I when I said I was gonna reserve my comment for last, I happen to think the least attractive, shall we say, ugly truck out there is the Silverado HD, and I think this new TRD Pro gives it a run for its money. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I just like, it has those cool little LED wings on the uh, front fenders uh, at the edges of the grills, but 
it just left me cold. But then I'm tired of the in your face, big truck look, mainly because I'm tired of seeing the idiots that drive them get up so close, you can't see anything but the grill uh, in your rear view mirror. So, but that's what sells. Like you said, like everyone said, the big bold trucks sell. Yeah. That's what the money is. Is anyone shocked though that Toyota didn't come out with this like revolutionary design? I mean, no. it's just, it is what it is. I, I do know that they're, they're saying that the powertrains are where the big changes are going to be. What's called an IMAX V8 or something like that. It's just, yeah, I'm it's sure just some sort of electrification would be my guess. There will be an electri electrified version, yeah. Yeah. Oh, you know, the, 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 the press material they're putting out is the same they did the last generation. We're ready to go battle with the, uh, the big boys, meaning the Detroit 3. They're doing that again. We'll see if they're successful, uh, but you're going up against vehicles that have an, un an unbelievable loyalty. So maybe they'll crack the nut this time. They certainly have the look to do it. I'm sorry, Benny, I cut you off. I was going to say, I don't think anybody, anything's going to shock the big truck market again ever like the early 90s full-size Dodge did with their design. No, yeah, I that agree. was a one-and-done thing. Like you and that saying. started the, the whole big grill uh, aspect, and that wasn't that big by comparison today. Okay, we're going to move on to our viewer question. This is from Thomas, and it's a good one. He said, I have noticed on the show, he's a longtime fan of the program, he's noticed that we're using a new test track. We're uh, now testing most of our vehicles at uh, the uh, Mason-Dixon Dragway up in the mountains of Maryland in uh, Boone's near Boonesboro. So what happened to the original drag strip? Okay, for well over 30 years, We've been testing at what used to be called the 7580 Dragway, but 7580 Dragway in Monrovia, Maryland. And uh, it's a track that uh, had a, Bill Wilkham, the owner, has run it forever and his father before him. And basically uh, some years ago, Bill decided that he was gonna close the track because there were plans to redevelop the area of the land around it. It's a fast growing region, it's becoming a, Washington uh, remote uh, outlying suburb. But when he closed the track, he uh, closed it for a while, let us continue to use it. And then the track was open again under uh, new management, but Bill still owned it. And now the track has officially closed for good. And it has been, at least on paper, sold. So the area will be redeveloped. And in the process, uh, Bill was nice enough to give us an introduction to the folks up at uh, Mason Dixon. So while the track's still there and we do have the opportunity to use it if we have to uh, because of weather or whatever, uh, we are moving most of our day-to-day -day drag strip work up to Mason Dixon and we're delighted to be there and they're very nice folks. And uh, so there it is. So unfortunately, after all those years, we had to say pretty much, if not totally, at least we'll see you later the 7580 dragway, which gets its name from the intersection of two highways, 75 and 80. And it's near, if you don't know where Monrovia is in Maryland, look up Mount Airy, Maryland. It's uh, very near that. So uh, thanks, Bill. Thanks, 7580. And uh, thanks, Thomas, for asking. Uh, I have to tell you, we shed a few tears uh, the last uh, couple of runs that we did there. Yeah, it was it was bittersweet because yeah. obviously the track had kind of fallen in disrepair. We had done what we could, and I know we caught a lot of flack from viewers about you know upkeep, but you know we painted it. We yeah, we painted we it. But grass. We also produce fifty two new shows a year, and we don't exactly we aren't in the business of paving and painting and upkeeping tracks. So we do what we can. Uh, so yeah, the last last like run down there I actually took a second and to remember because Benny and I have just been down up and down that track so many times John I'm sure you have too so uh yeah it was kind of bittersweet to go but Mason Dixon's awesome uh they are great location awesome facility great track and uh you know Elmer's just great to work with up there so can't thank them enough yeah it's still I have to say for me personally it, it it's because Craig Singhouse is the one that I think first just you know got us to go using 7580 because he would go out there and, and run his cars. So I mean it goes back uh, almost to the beginning of the show. We and before 7580, uh, we were using basically um, 
well, first it was Martin State Airport in Baltimore. Then we were using a couple of sections of interstate highway that were not open at the time. So uh, it was really the first real track that we ever had for routine testing. So, uh, you know, parting was quite uh, sweet sorrow, as they say. But thanks, Thomas. So as we wrap up everybody in this podcast, do we have any rants and raves uh, that we'd like to um, impart? No? Know, Betty D, you gotta have uh, something, man. I can't believe it. That's the quietest you've been all day. I'm pretty laid back these days, man. Nothing really gets to be right. Ben, ben now lives in the South and, and you know, a little, little slower pace. Although in all honesty, you live near Charleston and the Charleston traffic it's got to be getting you crazy a little bit. I, I don't leave my neighborhood hardly ever. I got everything I need here. <laughs> well, all right. We don't have it. That's a good thing. Nobody has rants. I think I ranted a little bit oh, before before this, though. Go. Go. I was just I was just talking about how um, New York City uh, drivers are just on another planet. They're on a whole other universe of driving. Um, <laughs> I, I recently went on a trip that we didn't talk about here and I'll probably talk about in a future podcast, but um, I drove uh, the all new Mercedes S-Class, which um, as many of you know, starts over six figures. And um, I sat in rush hour traffic on a Friday to get over the GW bridge. Um, and it was terrifying because people in New York City use the shoulder as another lane that's a lane to them and i didn't realize that was a thing i just thought oh maybe you know they're going to to get off an exit you know and there's all this traffic nope they'll they'll use it to merge and then i am side by side in one lane with somebody else and i i don't think i've ever been so scared driving a vehicle that was not i mean I, we drive cars all the time that aren't ours. And I was just like, you know what? Mercedes put me in this situation. It's going to be their problem. <laughs> if I'm using happens. that autonomous driving technology. Yeah. Semi-autonomous, was, I should say. I was thinking to myself, like, I would be terrified to use it in that situation because there's two, I mean, there's sensors all over cars that we drive now, but, you know, I'm already like fine a little nervous when I'm using it on the highway with a lot of traffic around me, but to do it in stop and go traffic, I know it can, but it's just, it's one of the things you just got to get used to like using all the time. And you have to have some sort of a little bit of trust in the car that you're driving. Of course, you know, the trust. one in the S class is probably going to be some of the best out there, but still um, it, it probably cannot really, uh, beat the unknowns of New York City drivers. And they say those unknowns is what will probably keep uh, autonomous driving from ever being quite as universally uh, used as, as a lot of the designers would like to. You just can't anticipate everything that people will do behind the wheel. Yes. Unless every vehicle you're around is an AI, so autonomous vehicle. One day. One day. <laughs> There goes the joy of driving. Uh, anyway, that's another editorial for another day. Thanks, everybody. That was uh, really probably one of the, the most informative podcasts we've done in a long time. Uh, covered a lot of ground, a lot of off-road ground, and some very new, interesting ground with the uh, GV80. But Greg, Ben, Jessica, thank you all for joining us. And everybody out there, thank you very much for listening to our podcast and, in some cases, being able to watch it. Thank our audio engineer, Jim Bigwood, who makes sure that we sound and uh, come across uh, as well as possible every week. Greg, our podcast producer, our podcast creator, Bob Mixter, who had the idea in the first place years and years ago. And to all of you out there, remember, if you want to watch Motor Week, uh, public television stations around the country, also on the Motor Trend Cable Network, go to our website, motorweek.org. Hit the uh, tab at the top about the show. Put in your zip code. You can find out where you can view us. Uh, on uh, Watch our videos and all of our road tests at youtube.com slash motorweek. Many of you do that now, millions a month. And come on down. Everything we've done for the last umpteen years is up there. And, of course, anywhere you've got a screen or social media, 
be sure to befriend us. And um, we've got, we've got, if you've got a screen, you can consume, as they say in these days, MotorWeek. Thanks for watching and thanks. Whoop, Jessica. I was gonna say, we Go. should probably plug, uh, we got a holiday weekend coming up, Benny D. Ah, oh yeah, we do. There will be a, <laughs> what season are we on? We are on season 12, part two. We'll be streaming for 48 hours. So jump in there and let's get retro. Give us the dates. July 4th. Is it three and four or just four? Uh, what are the dates? It's going to start Saturday. What, what date is that? That's the, that's the third. third. Okay. It'll start Saturday at uh, 8 a.m. And it'll go all through till probably Monday morning. So it'll loop. It's a 12-hour loop. So it'll just loop, 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 loop. If you can't catch one day, you'll catch it next. But our, uh, our retro review marathons have been doing very great for us. Again, that's on youtube.com slash motorweek. Thanks, Jessica. Thanks, Benny. Thanks, Greg. And thanks, everybody out there for being a part of Motor Week. You've been listening to the podcast of Motor Week, television's original automotive magazine. Motor Week is made possible by TireRack.com and RockAuto.com. For additional information on podcasts, videos, and showtimes, visit our website at MotorWeek.org. And watch Motor Week, television's longest-running automotive magazine series, each week on your local PBS station.